there we go. All right, <clears throat> so uh, we are evaluating the extent of change in ideas about American independence from 1763 to 1783. So that's a 20 year period, and I could be wrong, but I am pretty sure that, uh, I'm pretty sure that 1763 is when this French and Indian War ended. And that's sort of when a lot of historians say the American Revolution begins. Uh, let's just scan these docs really quick. So, seven, okay. So, you know, the extent of the change in ideas about the American independence. So, we've got a 20 year period, and it's talking about how ideas about American independence have changed. Now, I don't really know that much. I, all I can, I just know the standard sort of history narrative about the American Revolution, which is that we began to see ourselves more as a collection of colonies. That's all I really know. Um, sort of the standard narrative, but I guess we're going to run with that. Um, well, you got the Stamp Act. You got you got all of those like British acts. You got the Stamp Act. Uh, you get the line of demarcation, uh, which was a really uh, a big one that uh, the Americans were mad about, uh, that they weren't allowed to go settle in the frontier zones. Um I don't know. I guess I'm just gonna have to play it by ear about the my my outside information. So, but let's go ahead and have a look. All right, we got document one: a teapot made in England. Oh, that's interesting. Made in England. No stamp act. And liberty restored. Interesting. So, liberty restored means that Americans began to see themselves as already free, like. Liberty is already there, even though technically, even at this time, they weren't free. Like, they hadn't even signed the Declaration of Independence yet, right? That's interesting. Liberty restores. So, the Americans had always had liberty. Like, liberty as American. That's interesting. Uh, and the British did this, of course, because that's the Stamp Act. So, maybe... Okay, interesting. So, British, the British Stamp Act generated the idea of liberty as inherently American. That's, that is interesting. Uh, document two, the House of Burgesses. Okay, that's the, uh, Virginia House of Legislatures. Um, is the opinion of this committee that the sole right of imposing taxes is Virginia is now and ever hath been legally and constitutionally vested in the House of Burgesses, lawfully convened according to the ancient and established practice, the consent of the Council of His Majesty, King of Great Britain, or Governor for time for the time being. So again, the same idea here. We've always had these rights. So that's interesting. I've seen some the ancient practice. I was gonna say I didn't know if they were referring to the ancient American practice. That would have been interesting. It is the opinion of this committee that this is the undoubtable undoubted privilege of the inhabitants of this colony to petition a sovereign for redress and grievances, and that this it is lawful and expedient procedure to uh, the concurrence of his majesty's other colonies in dutiful address Paying the royal in, in, interposition in favor of the violated rights of America. Oh, boy, that's a lot of fancy words. Um, well, petition for redress, that's the phrase that's in the declar that's in the um, That phrase is in the Bill of Rights. That's a petition for redress of their government. Um, that's I think that's in the First Amendment, actually. Uh, that a humble, dutiful, and loyal address be presented to his majesty to assure him of our inviolable attachment to his sacred persons and government. So they've got ancient rights, but they also love the king. Uh, and they love the king, right? We love the king, but, uh, you know, we do have these rights. Please respect them. Please respect our rights. Uh, Samuel Adams. Ooh, Samuel Adams. All men have a right to remain in a state of nature as long as they please. State of nature. Now, if that rings a bell, that would be John Locke, Mr. John Locke, and Thomas Hobbes, their state of nature. Uh, and in the case of intolerable oppression, civil or religious, to leave society they belong to and enter into another. When men enter into another society, it is by voluntary consent, and they have the right to demand and insist upon the performance of such conditions and previous limitations as from equitable original compact. The natural liberty of man is free from any superior power on earth and is not under the will of the legislative authority of man, but only to have the law of nature for his rule. Okay, well, that's definitely some 
that's some John Locke stuff right there. So, you know, uh, society, we, we live in a society, but we live in a society because we choose to. Interesting. The state of nature. That's always a fun one, too. State of nature, right? What is the state of nature? Is it great? Is it terrible? Is it awesome? Does it suck? I don't know. Depends on who you are. Uh, Quaker leadership. The Pennsylvania Colonial Assembly. Uh, having considered with real sorrow the unhappy contest between the legislatures of Great Britain and the peoples of these colonies. <laughs> exactly, Joker. Exactly. <laughs> the animosity cities consequent therein. We have repeated public advice and private admonitions used our endeavors to dissuade the members of our religious society from joining with the public resolutions and promoted and entered into by some of the people which as we apprehended and so we now find have increased contentions and produced great discord and confusion so in other words we're trying to stay out of this whole thing we therefore incited by sincere concern for the peace and welfare of our country publicly do declare against every usurpation of power and authority and imposition of the laws of government to the laws of government laws and government and against all combinations of insurrections, conspiracies, illegal assemblies, and as we are restrained from them, conscientious discharge, duty by Almighty God. Um, we hope to maintain the fidelity we owe to the king and his government, as by law established, earnestly desiring the restoration of that harmony and concord which we have hitherto united people of these provinces. Okay, so it's interesting because that so sort of sounds like the Burgesses one, except they're saying that we want to just get along with the king basically we, we want to get along with the king so interesting so respect the king that's kind of that's what i'm the vibe i'm getting from this one and quakers were known pacifists so they were very you know they didn't like violence maybe they just in this case saw this discord as being worse than Anything else? Uh, Janet Shaw, Journal of a Lady of Quality. Oh my, a lady of quality, you say? Well, I'd like to meet. I'd, I'd like to meet a lady of quality. I'm not sure what that means, but I guess we'll find out. A Scot visiting her brother in North Carolina. At present, the martial law stands thus: an officer or committee man enters a plantation with his posse. The alternative is proposed: agree to join us, and your persons and properties are safe. If you refuse, we are directed to cut up your corn, shoot your pigs, burn your houses, seize your slaves, and perhaps tar and feather yourself. Not to choose the first question requires more courage than they are possessed of, and I believe that this method has seldom failed with the lower sort. Okay. Um, so this was in the middle of the Revolutionary War, and interesting. Um, join the Patriots or suffer the consequences. Jo that's the join or die, the, the Gaddison flag. That's kind of what they mean, like to join or see your property seized. Now, what's interesting about this is that it does seem to go against the other documents which we're talking about, you know, property is important. You should not take other people's stuff, right? Uh, let's see. Uh, an Anglican church minister in New York. That They're just hitting all the colonies. they got Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Carolina, Virginia, New York. they got all the colonies here. Uh, where is the Where the money is to come from, which will defray the enormous annual expense of three million sterling, for the American Revolution and all those other debts, I do not know. Certain I am that our commerce and agriculture, the two principal sources of our wealth, will not support such an expense. The whole of our exports from the 13 United Colonies, sorry, from the 13 colonies in the year 1765, amounted to only 2 million sterling, something like 2 million sterling, uh, is not so much by nearly half a million as our annual expenses would be were we independent. Okay, so... Those exports, no inconsiderable part of the profits, is well known. Uh, okay, so he's talking about... Um, so basically, this is a minister saying that if you declare independence... Um, yeah, all right. Yeah, no, worries, no worries, Toy Nice. Have a great rest of your day. Maybe you'll see us in a, maybe we'll see in a few hours. But I thank you for uh, for stopping by. 
Um, sorry. Anyways, um, so basically, don't declare independence, or it's going to cost a lot of money. Don't declare independence; it'll be expensive. Really expensive. Um, all of our trade won't be able to make up for it. Uh, boop, 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 Thomas Paine. Oh, Thomas Paine. The immortal Thomas Paine. The most radical of them all, Thomas Paine. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, these are the times of triumphs. I remember this. Um, but he who stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and women. Yeah, I, I remember. I read that in school. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered, yet we have the consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods, and that it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. Britain, with an army to enforce her tyranny, has declared that she has a right not only to tax, but to bind us in all cases whatsoever. So again, it's necessary to wage this war. And this is... This is kind of getting at this idea that um, America has always been free, right? We've always been free. We are free men, right? We must fight for that right, right? Fight for the right to freedom. Stand up for your rights. So, um, the extent of the change in ideas about American independence from 1763 to 1783. Well, so kind of scanning the documents, kind of going back over them, um, it would seem that... It would seem that... So the early documents before the, before the actual fighting of the started... So in the 1760s, before the actual Revolutionary War broke out, um, everybody was pretty much in favor of it. There was a little bit of a uh, little bit of confusion during the revolution. Like these Quakers weren't super happy about it. Um, apparently, the war also led to lots of property confiscation. And um, whoops, what in the world is that? Okay, weird. Uh, oh, there's a link right here. That's fine. Uh, and then this Anglican minister is talking about the difficulties that you would have paying for it, right? What then must our situation be or what state of our trade when oppressed with such a burden of annual expense when every article of commerce, every necessity of life, together with our lands, must be heavily taxed to defray that expense? Yeah. Wait a minute. Did I misread this? The whole of our export to the thirteen from the thirteen United Colonies in the year seventeen sixty nine amounted to this sterling, which is not so much by near half a million as our annual expense would be were we independent. Those exports were the still part of the profits arising from them. It's well known. Centred finally in Britain to pay the merchants manufacture their goods we import hence and yet left us still in debt. Oh, wait, I misread this. Okay, sorry. And see, this is, you You can always, it's why it doesn't hurt to go back and look at the document. Says, I misinterpreted this. I misread this. Um, he's not saying that we shouldn't declare independence because it would be expensive. He's saying we should declare independence because we would make more money, right? So he's saying, yes, we, we should declare independence because we won't have to pay... Um, we won't have to pay the extra um, profits of the uh, exporters, right? We won't have to send money to Great Britain, basically. Um, so basically, he's like, I don't know what's going to happen about the debts, the money we're lending out, or the money we're borrowing to pay for the revolution, but uh, I know for a fact that we're going to have a lot more once uh, once we uh, once we declare it. Okay, so, sorry, I misread that. Uh, just a quick lesson that you can always go back and reread documents and don't be afraid to. Okay, um, with that said, I think we have enough to go on here. So let me just really quick evaluate the extent of the change of the idea of revolution. Okay. I'm going to switch over to the Google Doc and we'll figure out what we're going to do here. 
Okay. Swap over here. Ah, there we go. Okay, so... Hmm. Evaluate the extent of the change of the idea about American independence. About America. Not the revolution, but about of about American independence. So, what do we have? We seem to have... Bum, 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 bum. We seem to have a couple of different things. We have this claim about ancient rights. This claim of ancient rights, which we see in uh, ancient liberty, right? The idea that liberty is, is sacred and must always be fought for. Um, we see that in document one, document two, and you see it. it's implied in document seven. Um, there is a strain of thought. There is a um, concern over violence and uh, property rights. Right, we can see that in documents um, five and four, which the Quakers talk about the discord and that Scottish woman talks about her brother in North Carolina. And then I guess we have the economic benefits, I suppose. Um, let's see, which one do we I want to... Um, oh, even three is kind of talking about that. Actually, no, we, what we should do is we can um, we can swap out number three and the economic benefits we can put here three versus um, what was it? Uh, six, six, that's the, yeah. So what's interesting is, okay, so one thing you have to kind of understand here too is that change used to be, it used to be when you got a DBQ, you had to do exactly what they, the exact, thinking skill they told you. You don't really have to do that anymore. Um, they've sort of changed that. Um, but back in the day, like if it said change, you had to do, um, you had to do, um, what was I going to say? You had to do a change in continuity one if it said change. You don't have to anymore, but you used to have to. So because this is an older one, that's probably what it's asking for. So I'm going to do that anyways, but I'm going to go ahead and structure things like this. So let's get our thesis out. So uh in that's thesis and let me zoom in so you guys can see a little bit easier my apologies there we go a little easier to see let's scroll down a little bit okay thesis statement boom 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 in the years 1763 to 1783 which is when the treaty of paris was signed so that's the years of the american revolution ideas about the american revolution uh, shifted uh, shifted in the direction of independence uh, versus previously being part of the US being part of sorry what am I talking about the British Empire the British Empire Booyah. Um, in particular, the claim of ancient rights of representation and the, that's one of our uh, ancient rights of representation as is seen by the works of Thomas Paine and the uh, economic benefits of uh, uh, the economic benefits, as is described by, uh, what was the name of that person? See, the thing about documents is you can always take, if you need a specific example for your thesis, you can always just go to the document and be like, what's that guy's name? Oh, Charles Inglis. Inglis. Charles Inglis. As described by Charles Inglis. Uh, however, there were uh, detractors who feared uh, the damage to property rights of the violence of the revolution. Booyah. Okay. There we go. We have three prongs. Uh, we have three 
three prongs of an argument. But before we go ahead and write it up, we're going to kick things off with another dad joke. All righty. Um... How does a penguin build a house? How does a penguin build a house? Does anybody know? It glues it together. It glues it together. Additionally, I was talking to my, uh, my dad on the phone last night, and... Uh, well, he told me a joke about boxing, but I guess I missed the punchline because I didn't get it. All right, enough of this. Uh, okay, that's, that's, that's good. All right, that's good. So let's see. Okay. Uh, over the course of the American Revolution slick. Yeah, no. <laughs> I try, I try. Over the course of the American Revolution uh enlightenment ideas about freedom and political rights became more militant and anti british so let's see i feel like in this one in particular we're going to need to use the we're going to need to reference dates a lot reference dates a lot so let's see uh we'll start with the part of the virginia house of burgesses that's document number 1 for example, the Virginia House of Burgesses. The Virginia House of Burgesses um, protested the Stamp Act by appealing to what they described as ancient rights of assembly. Right? They described it as ancient Enlightenment ideas. Actually, I should I should qualify this enlightenment ideas and british history um uh describes ancient rights of assembly but also proclaimed their loyalty to the king yay king All right proclaimed their loyalty to the king now notice by the way uh notice that i'm gonna quickly switch over because i got some we, we, we're on track we're doing good. Um, no, that's not it. Here we go. Okay. So notice here, I'm going to go to document number one, or document number two, right? See, this thing is like three paragraphs long, right? Um, but I've summarized it really quickly, and I've mainly focused on, um, I've focused on this middle part, and I've focused on this ending part, right? Uh, talking about the historic, or sorry, I focused on the first two parts, right? In fact, actually, I've really only talked about this first paragraph, opposing the Stamp Act, um, appealing to this ancient right, um, but also, oh, actually, I've talked about the ending, sorry. So the point is, though, the point is, though, I, uh, I have been picking and choosing, right, picking and choosing how I use the document. And that's a really good thing to always keep in mind when you do the real DBQs. You get to pick and you get to choose how you want to use the document. You're not required to use every part of every document. And that can even be part of your argument. Dago Child, oh, so good to see you. Thank you for the well wishes. I hope maybe I'll see you a little bit later. I don't know if you're still sticking around, but I hope I'll see you a little bit later, even if you don't, uh, even if you if, if you can come back. So anyways, so my I just wanted to quickly point out that uh, when it comes to working with documents, uh, you can be a bit selective. That's part of the craft of writing a DBQ is you have a little selection possibility in there. Cool. All right. So that's document number two. Um, to do, do this protest takes on the form of loyal opposition, um, rejecting the individual act, but proclaiming loyalty to the king, hedging the protest. Um, over an act of act of parliament. Oh, wait a minute! I think we got a donation. Someone just uh, did. We just get a donation. The little donation thing went active. Oh, oh, oh! Maybe. 
Maybe. Uh, maybe it's taking a second. Um, over an individual act of parliament. Right. This was early in the days of the American Revolution at the time when it was hoped that maybe a resolution could be reached with the United Kingdom in order to prevent separation such as the uh, what was that one called the com committees no uh, the committee of reconciliation reconciliation I remember this when I took US history in the eighth grade the committee of reconciliation I remember this because I had a project where I had to make a timeline about the early part of the American Revolution and I made the timeline and I spaced everything out perfectly and then our teacher told us to include stuff from a different chapter that I hadn't read yet. And they talked about the Committee of Reconciliation. And it didn't fit in my timeline. And I was so mad. Like, like seventh grade me was... So, sorry, not eighth grade. Seventh grade me was so mad that my timeline was now going to be messed up. And I had done it all in pen and crayon. I was pissed. Um, anyways, uh, such as the Committee of Reconciliation, which attempted to prevent war. Which attempted to prevent war uh, after Lexington and Concord. Dope. Uh, okay, so there we have even a little bit of context, right? Right, some some context and a little bit of time. Um, coolio, coolio. Okay, so this situation contrasts with later writings about the revolution such as those of, uh, let's see, uh, let's see, document seven is Thomas Paine that's in the midst of the revolution one is the Samuel Adams one. Um, let's see, such as that of, actually we'll just do, we'll just do, um, we'll just do Thomas Paine. It's the easiest one. We might even just leave off the third document. Um, such as those of Thomas Paine who wrote that the British we're trying to erase the natural liberty that Americans had a right to, right? This document in particular was written around the same time as the Declaration of independence. Uh, let's see, was it July 4th? What's the exact date of Thomas Paine's writing here? Uh, December 23rd, December 23rd. Okay, so it's after the Declaration of Independence. Um, and reflects the heady, the heady atmosphere of the official declaration of freedom from Great Britain. The purpose, I'm just going to go ahead and we're going to do a hip statement here. We're going to do a purpose statement just because I'm feeling like it. The purpose of Mr. of Thomas, also I'm going to uh, the purpose of Thomas Payne's writing was to mobilize support for the cause of independence, considering that about one third of colonists were loyalists. The declaration needed support. Considering, considering, not consider, considering that about a third of colonists were loyalists, the Declaration needed more support. And so Thomas <clears throat> Paine appealed to the ideas of natural rights and wrote of British tyranny 
Tyranny, tyranny. Thomas Paine. You know, Thomas Paine is actually low key probably one of the most radical thinkers America has ever had. Like you should, if you if you ever have time, go read his um, some of his extended work. Like he is actually low key one of the most radical thinkers ever. Like even some today, some of his ideas are just like, whoa, that's crazy, man. Like you're talking about abolishing property. You're talking about a guaranteed minimum income. He even said everybody should get a fixed income. Like even today, that's still something that'll get you like called a communist and. Um, or you just won't win the presidential election like Andrew Yang. Um, not that I'm comparing a Thomas Paine to Andrew Yang, but uh, that, that kind of thing, right? Something that just gained a little bit of mainstream attention. Thomas Paine was talking about that stuff 200 years ago. Um, anyways, that's your short lesson today. Uh, on the discussion of economic benefits, on the economic side of the debate over... American independence. There was also a shift to being in favor of independence. For example, in the years before the fighting broke out, there was a teapot commissioned in England which protested the Stamp Act. Right, so we got that teapot, right? The fact that the pot, the teapot itself was ordered from England meant that there were clearly strong ties between the merchant classes of the colonies and those of England. Which also, keeping in mind this is the 1700s, that teapot, like uh, here, let me show you. It's very possible, let's just really quick have a look at it again. It is entirely possible that that teapot here, I'm going to just get some record real quick. It's entirely possible that that teapot was actually made in China, shipped to England, and then shipped to America. Like, this actually was a big part of the British Empire's trade, was to, to buy goods from what is now India, what is now China, what is now Southeast Asia, ship them to England, and then sell them to her colonies. So it's possible that that teapot was actually made by someone in China. Entirely possible. I guess... Some things don't change. History really does repeat itself. Anyways, uh, where were we? Sorry. So the fact that this teapot protesting the British was made in England meant that there were clearly strong ties between the merchant classes of the colonies and those of England. These close ties would not be enough to keep the colonies from leaving and this is reflected in the speech by the Anglican minister uh, what was his name um, 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 Charles Inglis Charles Inglis uh, Charles Inglis I feel like that's just an old way of saying English it might just be an old way of saying uh, English. Okay. Um, boom, 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 boom. Um, English who advocated independence on the grounds that Americans would pay fewer taxes. Which, you know, hey, that sounds... Uh, hey, we like that in America. We like fewer taxes we enjoy that that we like that we need that we want that um by the speech on the grounds um this shift away from the close economic ties of the colonies to the ideas of independence to avoid having to pay British 
taxes. I'm gonna adjust my headphones. Adjust my headphones real quick. Sorry, they're a little loose on my head there. Okay. Uh, the ideas of independence to avoid British taxes was a bold idea. This represents a fundamental shift as it would have denied merchants. Scroll down here. It would have denied merchants access to the markets of the British Empire, which by this time included much of India and parts of West Africa. Um, I feel like this isn't a great explanation, but um, I'm going to go with it, and maybe we'll come back and fix it. I feel like this paragraph isn't well put together. But I'll come back and fix it. You can do that, by the way. Um, that's document six. Okay. Uh, one area in which views of the revolution <clears throat> did not change would be the fear of violence or seizure of property. In the, let's see, hang on a minute. Let me double check the dates, got to double check the dates here. So the Quaker speech, uh, it's document four, that's 1775, and document five is also 1775. Um, let's see, something about property. Um, hmm, uh, document three doesn't say anything about property. Can I find an earlier document that says something about property? Hmm. You know what? It's it's not great, but I'm going to run with it since I'm just going to say those two documents are uh, are technically one is before the other. I'm just going to run it, even though they're both in the same year. So that clearly is not a great deal of time to, to be arguing a change. But uh, if I think of a better way to phrase it, I'll change it midway. Uh, in the year 1775, a Quaker, uh, a Quaker, Quaker preacher lamented the violence and discord which the revolution was causing and advised pledging loyalty to the king not pegging pledging 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 loyalty to the king um pledging loyalty to the king of britain this desire to avoid violence had been hinted at earlier such as with the writings of Samuel Adams. However, with the outbreak of the conflict, now this preacher must directly uh, state this position to his followers. Uh, I'll state this. Uh, this is document. Uh, this was document uh, four. Document four. Let's state this position to his followers. <clears throat> it is possible, however, that this preacher's perspective might have been in favor of independence and that he was constrained by his 
his church's pacifist ideology and required to condemn violence even if he uh, condemned violence regardless of why it occurred. Hmm, except now I feel like that contradicts everything I've just said. It's a good point of view argument, um, but now I feel like it's contradicting everything I just said already. Um, <laughs> Hmm. Hmm. Okay. We're gonna uh, I'm gonna take that and we're gonna move that. And if I find some way to make it work, I'll make it work. Uh, but for now I'm just gonna move it out. Um additionally, around the same time a foreigner visiting her brother in North Carolina commented on the violence and threat of violence that the revolution had encouraged. The revolution had encouraged. A threat of violence that the revolution had encouraged. Uh, let's document uh, document uh, s uh, five. It was document five. Document five. Um, both of these documents come from the middle of the American Revolution, meaning that the Fear of violence, the the concern about the outbreak of violence, which had been hinted at earlier, for example, in the Virginia, or for example, in document, was it document two, the Virginia House of Burgess? Boy, I am struggling with this right now. I do not know what happened. Why I'm suddenly so off my game. I felt like I had this. Um, um, let's see. <laughs> let's see. Hmm. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Hmm. Huh. Hmm. <sighs> dog barking, dog barking. Okay, let's... I'm about to do some major mental gymnastics. I'm about to do some major mental gymnastics, which you may just have to do to salvage yourself. Um, okay, hang on. Because I also realized I re-looked at document number two, and I realized that is also not exactly what he says. I have to... I guess I really just didn't interpret these ones very closely. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, all right. We're going to swap this up. Um, do the fear of disorder or chaos. Um, okay. The Virginia House of Burgesses had also hinted at the discord which might come from British oppression 
which that's document number two, uh, hinted at the discord that might come from British uh, policies, policies on taxation and law. But now it seems that those policies that that predicted uh, violence, that predicted chaos has come to pass. That predicted chaos has come to pass. And this preacher must address his followers directly about it. Let's see. Additionally, at the same time, a foreigner visiting a brother to comment on the violence and threat of violence. Um, okay. Revolution. Which stand in stark contrast. Uh, revolution and describe uh, violence and the loss of property which stands in stark contrast to previous documents which attempted to reaffirm the property rights of Americans. Um, encouraged against loyalists. Okay. Oh boy, this is really coming down to the wire here. I don't know. Uh, ooh. <laughs> uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, we're really, ooh, ooh. I'm getting concerned about this one. Um, <clears throat> both these documents come from the Middle American Revolution and describe violence and loss of property, which stands in stark contrast to previous documents which had attempted to reaffirm the property rights of Americans. This, in short, the American, the idea of property. Actually, you know what? Chaos, divorce, and caused loyalty to the king. Just follow directly about it and encourage them to stay loyal, which would protect their lives and probably their property, right? We're just going to use that hedging language, probably, probably. Right? We can't be a thousand percent sure, but we're just going to say probably. In short, the idea of property rights uh, shifted over uh, concern, the concern over uh, violence and property rights shifted in the course of the American Revolution period. Okay, this is not great. I'm um, kind of done. This. You can probably tell I've done some very mental gymnastics here to come up with at least a semi-coherent argument. Um, I don't know why I really fell off the ball on this one. I really just kind of must not have read those documents very carefully. I'm going to have to do it more carefully next time. Um, we got context and we have purpose. Uh, let's see what else do we got. Uh, we have a debate. We need one more example of a hip statement. Um, oh, I got it. The Stamp Act. Part of the reason for all of the protest against um, against policies like the Stamp Act was the long history of benign neglect by the British Empire to the 13 colonies, which in short had meant few to no direct taxes. Uh, direct taxes. However, with 
the conclusion of the French and Indian War, the British needed to keep soldiers in the colonies to protect the colonists and help collect payments of taxes. So that's, I, I think we can make this both context and our outside evidence. Um, um, period. Nope, period. <laughs> this fundamental change would drive a wedge between the economic bonds of the merchant classes in the colonies and in England. Okay. Perfect, we'll just delete that. All right, we have both outside evidence and our context statement. Okay. Uh, oh, we gotta get our, yeah, we gotta get our context statement real quick. Okay, contextualizing. Alrighty, um, the American Revolution. So, since the f dis, uh, since the voyages of Columbus, the Americas had been a place greatly influenced by. Ah, no, this is dumb. Let's let's not let's let's start. The, um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um. How would we even contextualize this? You know, I don't know what the rules are about contextualization in an A push essay, but I'm going to guess since A push is a lot smaller in frame size that I can get away with contextualizing a little bit less than I would have to do in a world history class. So let's start with that. Um, the competition between European powers in the Americas <clears throat> has had a long history and actually had long affected the 13 colonies in the British Empire. The various wars against Spain and France had helped to weld together the colonies into a into a common wealth of the mind in which they saw themselves as a united entity the american revolution um the american revolution kicked off by protests against British taxation and land use policies, such as the line of demarcation, which is the line of demarcation, um, would change the history of the region forever yeah okay that's your generic history channel it will change it forever would change everything okay uh yeah it's, i'm not really sure if that's the greatest contextualization statement i've ever written uh but i'm gonna go with it because we're about out of time uh that's probably the closest dbq i've ever written to the time frame i gotta read these documents read the documents carefully ladies and gentlemen that's the lesson of this very particular dbq read the documents carefully or you're gonna have to go back and make a thousand corrections like i did